we see in the first reading from the Acts of the Apostles that Paul, after having made his appeal to Rome, is sent there and he continues his mission of evangelization, especially among his own, the brother Jews. It says, three days later, he called together the leaders of the Jews and they came to him and Paul bore witness to the truth of the gospel. And this made me reflect once again the different circumstances between uh, the, event, the apostles of that time in spreading the gospel, especially among the Jews, and the situation that we have today. In fact, when those Jews came to St. Paul, maybe there was a mixture of Pharisees and Sadducees and of course, they don't agree upon and dispute about whether there is a resurrection of the dead and the existence of angels and such. But regarding the existence of God, there was absolutely no question. If somebody ever questioned that, it would just be sheer blasphemy. But you see, today, in evangelizing today, it's a whole different situation because the existence of God is called into question and is seriously doubted by Christians, by Catholics. I just read yesterday that in Ireland, the belief in the existence of God is becoming less and less among their people. This particular poll recorded that in 1999, 96% of the Irish population believed in God's existence. 1999. Nine years later, today, that's down to 84%. 84%, which is you know, still quite high, relatively speaking, you know, for the rest of the Western world. But, nevertheless, it shows a certain trend. Now, someone might commonly say and respond to this statistic, Oh, they're losing their faith in Ireland. But really, that isn't the case. You know, that's not an accurate statement. It's not that they're just losing their faith, but it's more accurate to say they're losing their minds. That is, they're losing their ability to reason clearly. Because, again, strictly speaking, the existence of God isn't a matter of faith. It is a matter of faith and that it is part of the deposit of faith, of course, that God exists. But the church also teaches, and the First Vatican Council defined, that man can come to know the, exist, the existence of God just by the use of his human reason. So that's why we can say you know, that the Irish, they're losing their ability to reason. If they seriously doubt the existence of God. This is one reason why the scripture says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. It doesn't say, not the person who has no faith. It says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And so the church teaches that there are, this is laid out in the catechism, two ways, principally, that we can come to know of God's existence just by using our own good reason. And they part from the world or from the man himself. First, by parting from the world, how can we know that God exists? Well, by observing the world, we see that there is cause and effect, that every effect has a cause. And this, with regard to motion, to being. Now, this argument is a little more philosophical, a little more difficult. And yet, in a certain sense, it too is intuitive. Every, cause, every effect has its cause. And every cause has its cause with regard to motion, with regard to being, existence, and so on and so forth. Every cause has its own cause. But this cannot go on for an infinite series Causes can't simply explain themselves. If we want to back things up all the way back to the Big Bang, if we want to say that 
primordial ball of whatever you want to call it, you know, doesn't explain its own existence and doesn't explain the, its own effect of the bang, if that is actually the case and, and the way things worked. doesn't explain it. So there must be a first cause with regard to motion and with regard to being, existence. A first cause, an uncaused cause. And this is what we call God. And of course, it is no coincidence that the name of God is I am. I am who am. He who is. He does not come from any other, but he simply is. Infinite and perfect being who is capable of giving being existence to everything else. And from God we derive our existence and we continue in existence. Now, of course, we don't call, these aren't proofs of God's existence in the mathematical sense, you know, according to the natural science, but we speak of simply convincing and converging arguments that leave no room for reasonable doubt. Again, reasonable. This is another reason why the Holy Father today is talking so much about faith and reason. Faith and reason. Our faith should be reasonable, and it is reasonable. Now, another argument from the world is the intelligent design argument, as it's called, and I've spoken of before, that is, that the beauty and the order that we see in the world indicates that there is an intelligence who put things in that order. Again, if we, if we look around, if we just go for a walk on one of these spring days and observe the birds and the beauty of the flowers, etc., you know, is it really logical to think that that came about by chance? The plants, the animals, the complexity of their structures let alone man who has the ability to reason and reflect and has self-consciousness. He's aware of himself, that he exists, that he's a person, that he can say, I. I'm getting into the next proof. But at any rate, again, we see how silly it is. It's just silliness to say that that, that all came about by chance. That's unreasonable. So, we can prove that God exists by departing from the world, but also by departing from man. Just looking at and examining our own interior life and certain concepts that we can understand, such as truth, goodness, and evil, etc. Again, if God doesn't exist, then good and evil has no meaning. It has no meaning, has no sense. There's no moral responsibility with regard to anything. And of course, this is a position of some philosophers today. But again, we hold that it's an unreasonable one. It's unreasonable. And nobody, practically speaking, lives according to such a philosophy. But practically speaking, we all live as if there really is objective good and objective evil. There's no doubt about it. And also, as I had mentioned yesterday, Man's own desire for beatitude that is infinite and unending happiness. All an indication of man's spiritual side, the fact that he possesses a mortal soul, that he is not the origin of himself, but that he's tending towards God, who is that infinite beatitude. So tonight, we finish our novena to the Holy Spirit. And we want to pray tomorrow, the day of Pentecost, for a greater effusion of the Holy Spirit in our world to enlighten the minds and the hearts of men regarding not only the truth of God's existence, but also all the other truths that our holy faith teaches us.
Jesus.